Hello, this is Linda Harvey and I'm president of Mission America and I'm here to present another video in this series from Protect Ohio Children about what is being taught in sex education classes in Ohio. And as you probably know, this information is comes out of a records request that Ohio Value Voters did, which is uh, the uh, oversight organization of Protect Ohio Children, a records request asking school districts throughout Ohio to tell us what are they doing? Well, this is what we've discovered. And to repeat what Diane Stover has explained several times before in previous videos, uh, these uh, are uh, teachings that are happening despite the fact that we have an Ohio abstinence law passed in 1999, we have a law that mandates that abstinence until marriage shall be the expected standard in Ohio schools. And yet we have these comprehensive sexuality education uh, curricula being taught. Sometimes they teach abstinence one week and then the next week they'll teach this other very different material. And so, uh, what we need are parents to get involved and stop what is essentially normalizing sexual activity, sometimes as young as 11 and possibly even younger. Sexual activity and normalizing abortion, normalizing homosexuality, normalizing gender confusion, normalizing condom use, and saying that all of this is part of a normal uh, middle school and teenager's life. It is not and it is not public health, and it is dangerous. Again, all of the material that I'm about to review is available at ohiovaluevoters.org, Protect Ohio Children. Now in this video, I'm going to go over what we found in the Cincinnati area, um, in uh, the Cincinnati public schools and what they're using. And uh, what I'm going to go over here are what is called the National Sexuality Standards, which is a framework developed at the national level. And as we will look at this, then what happens, they have standards and then they apply lessons, develop lesson plans, what are called curriculum, uh, uh, that line up with these so-called standards. These are not actually very high standards. They're extremely low. They will take our children into very dangerous, high-risk, immoral territory, but they call them standards. And these standards were developed by a, a coalition of groups that are um, advocates for youth, SICUS, and buddies of Planned Parenthood, and all of the other pro-homosexual groups you can imagine. And so this is not... Um, this is not a group of people who are endorsed by the federal government. This is a renegade group. No pro-life or pro-family voices were part of the development of the nat national sexuality education standards. Always remember that. So here we have these going on in Cincinnati Public Schools. So I'm going to share my screen now with you and you can we can go over some of this. So, so first of all, we're going along with the 15 harmful elements, uh, the same that we've uh, talked about before with um, the previous material that Diane Stover has presented. The, the National Sexuality Education Standards show uh, uh, that they uh, unfortunately meet 13 out of the 15 harmful elements that were um, designated by the Protect uh, uh, Child Health Coalition that uh, Ohio Value Voters and Mission America are both part of. These, again, these standards are, were a coalition of groups that parents would be appalled if you actually, actually looked at what's behind these groups. They, there is some level uh, on the national sexuality standards of um, endorsement at, by a, an area of the Centers for Disease Control, but as we've seen with COVID, as we've seen with the HIV and AIDS agenda going on for years and years, our, our public health arm at the federal government has not, uh, has drifted away from true public health standards. They are very much have been taken 
captive, at least portions of the CDC, by special interest groups. So don't let that sway you and give credibility to what are obscene, pornographic, high risk, and highly inappropriate uh, standards here that you will start to see. And again, Planned Parenthood is connected all the way through this. So let's go down and let's start with the first one. And again, this is, I'm gonna go back up again, K through 12. This is K through 12, okay? So they will have different ones for different areas, but starting in kindergarten, they're going to be emphasizing some of these very problematic lifestyles, uh, sexual orientation, um, gender confusion, different types of families. That's where they start with for little kids. They, you know, there are different types of families and they will normalize all of that. So what, what they, this uh, uh, national sexuality uh, standards are, again, a framework being used by Cincinnati Public Schools and how they're applying that and what curricula they are uh, using to meet these standards. We are still investigating that and we will let you know, but what we're gonna show you here is how certain popular curricula around the country use the sexuality standards and, um, they, and how it, highly inappropriate this is. The first of these uh, harmful CSE elements is sexualizing children. And of course, the, the sexuality standards meets, unfortunately meets that very low standard. They talk about, they present sexual development as a normal, natural, healthy part, uh, normal, natural, healthy part of human development that should be, should be part of every health education curriculum. The, the issue with this is that uh, what they do with this is that they go beyond the idea of normal physical development. This is sexual development. In other words, they're uh, assuming that children have sexual feelings, need to be get uh, graphic sexual information as early as possible. And so uh, one of the curricula that are used is called the It's All One curriculum endorsed by Planned Parenthood. And they will say things like sexual behavior ranges widely below our descriptions of some common sexual behaviors, masturbation, uh, caressing, kissing, sharing erotic fantasies, and so on. What they're doing is, again, sexualizing children as low as, as young as possible. By the end of fifth grade, students should be able to describe male and female reproductive systems, okay, including body parts and their functions. When we see what they do with this, it becomes way over the top and anatomical lessons, including um, male body parts, for instance, that are involved in a sexual, about to perform a sexual act, and you know what I'm saying. Uh, this is not part of normal physiological explanation. They make it way too graphic, and um, again, these are, presented in mixed sex classrooms, boys and girls together. And you can only imagine how this, what this does uh, as far as any idea of modesty and um, limits and boundaries that kids would naturally have. They're not ready for much of this, certainly not at fifth, uh, fifth grade. They're not ready for this in many of these, in many of these age groups. Um, so, here are the kinds of things. I'm just gonna show my screen. The It's All One curriculum, um, lots of touching in intimate ways, uh, stimulating a partner's genitals and so on, okay. By the end of the eighth grade, students should be able to describe situations and behaviors that constitute bullying, sexual harassment, sexual abuse, sexual assault, incest, rape, and dating violence, okay. We know those things happen, but should children be asked by their teachers to describe rape and incest? I mean, think about it. So by the end of the 12th grade, the children should be able to describe the human sexual response cycle. That's what I'm talking about. That, again, they're into the elements of sexual pleasure and intimacy that logically and um, most, um, in, a, in a most healthy way, belong for, to waiting until marriage. By the end of 12th grade, children, uh, students should be able to describe healthy and unhealthy romantic and or sexual relationships. Well, okay, uh, that might be part of uh, 
you know, some kind of issue of consent, and that comes uh, right after this. But, you know, many of this, much of this belongs in the context of marriage, and a healthy relationship, in their view, is one that might include contraception and the full range of sexual behaviors. That's not, um, that's not from medical research that is not healthy teen behavior. It leads to and contributes to the epidemic of STDs that we have in this country right now, which these people seem to want to ignore for some reason. Also, abortions, and that's the taking of a human life. This is completely ignored throughout uh, these standards. Number two is that teaches children to consent to sex. Now, with the Me Too movement, there's been quite a bit of focus on being able to say no to sex. And of course, we want nothing involving sexual assault. But here we have, by the end of eighth grade, students should be able to demonstrate the use of effective communication and negotiation skills about the use of contraception, including abstinence and condoms. You know, again, abstinence and condoms are kind of equivalent. You, you know, you may have sex or you may not uh, have sex. And if you do, make sure you use condoms. And negotiation skills, okay, what they do is they will have role-playing exercises. These are very big in these comprehensive sex education curricula. Role plays where they put children in these incredibly uh, intimate and very detailed discussions and where they have to play sometimes same-sex partners and um, but negotiating for how far you're going to go in a sexual situation. This is again modesty smashing and ideals shattering situations for kids. Imagine the child who is watching a, an admired peer do this and then sitting there wondering um, the adults all think this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay, you know, it's again, it's normalizing all of this behavior and in great detail. For instance, let's look at some of these. Uh, so examples from a program called Rights, Respect and Responsibility developed by Advocates for Youth. Advocates for Youth is a very problematic organization. They're far left, they are pro-abortion, they are uh, pro-teen, um, sexuality at, uh, and even younger, and they are uh, distributors of some of the most graphic and obscene uh, sexuality materials out there and curricula out there. So here we have one, rights, respect, responsibility, sometimes known as the three R's curriculum. I would check to see if that is used in your school. Uh, you've been, uh, you, you love being in a relationship with person two, Person two, hmm. how uh, detached for a very intimate uh, relationship you're about to have. You two seem like you're made for each other. You want to try something you've never done before with them, but figure you should talk with them about it first. Now, there's so many problems with this. This makes a very mechanistic view of sex. For these people that are all about sex, they're treating people like they're robots and uh, that everything is negotiated. You know, when you get married and you're involved in intimacy, um, short of assault, which doesn't happen in most marriages, praise God, but you know, you, you don't talk about these things. It's a, it's a romantic relationship. Passion is supposed to happen. Um, here, because there's actually so much danger, frankly, they believe everyone needs to stop at every step of the way. Teenagers are not going to do this. They're, they're being very unrealistic. They simply will not do this. Social barriers, embarrassment, everything else. So they're leading kids down a path of thinking, oh yeah, I know how to do this. And then they get in those situations and they do things they never intended to do. So this doesn't really work. So under the banner of back up here, we're talking about consent. It teaches kids both to say no, but also how to say yes or think they know how to say yes or have limits. And of course they get themselves into very dangerous situations. By the end of 12th grade, students should be able to demonstrate boundaries as they relate to intimacy. Again, they'll think they have boundaries. Uh, that's why so many people end up in abortion clinics because they 
they're teenagers. They don't have the maturity level to do all of these things that, that these curriculum developers who, again, think of children as animals or robots, uh, think they ought to be able to do. So uh, sexual decision-making. So the other thing that this, these curricula often do uh, in this one, in the sexuality standards do, is to promote anal and oral sex. You know, you don't even know where to start with how wrong this is. It is medically high risk. There is no way that anal sex can ever be done safely with or without a condom. Injury is a very common result. And we know this, but you know why this is being presented and oral sex to some extent as well, but anal sex is being normalized because of the LGBTQ um, folks. They, they are the ones who are pushing for inclusive sexuality standards. Inclusive means putting all these different uh, activities and normalizing them in front of all children just because they are uh, common within certain behaviors and lifestyles. They're still all dangerous for everyone. And so, uh, and, and disease carriers, sexually transmitted infection carriers, none of this should be presented in front of kids, but they, they do. And you can see the kind of graphic information that uh, they will put in their standards. They also, of course, across the board, along that same line, promote homosexual, bisexual uh, behavior. And then by the end of fifth grade, the kids have to have you know, all, all kinds of definitions of these terms. Well, you really can't describe bisexual, gay, homosexual, lesbian without describing to some extent uh, what they're involved in and it's certainly normalizing those. But, uh, you know, what makes it, what makes two homosexual men different than a male and a female? Again, you have to get into some graphic information there. You don't have to be real graphic, but way more graphic than you really need to be. And you're normalizing these behaviors. And of course, then gender identity. We know now that schools are, uh, too many of them are promoting the idea that you can actually change genders. This is dangerous. This leads kids into um, a territory that will uh, lead them into a lifetime of health problems because they try to alter their bodies and you can never actually change gender. And um, they were, are usually always made infertile. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. That's a separate standard. Also promotes sexual pleasure is another one of the standards. In the, these uh, sexuality standards, there is no direct evidence found. However, when you start, again, identify body parts that play a role in sexual pleasure. Well, you've got the certain body parts that are primarily for sexual pleasure on the female or in the male or areas of the body. You know, do kids really need all this? They do not. This is, this is eroticizing this information. That's why we call it obscene and pornographic and very age inappropriate. And they always say it's, um, it's medically accurate. Well, it's medically accurate to describe all kinds of interactions that people have. That doesn't mean they're necessarily beneficial interactions. So um, the, while this, they, this doesn't have a direct evidence of number five, the promoting sexual pleasure standard here, some of the individual curricula that apply the national sexuality standards probably do focus on that. Promoting solo and or mutual masturbation. This again, this is another way of sexualizing children by legitimizing whatever you want to do in that area. You get, you get kids involved in sexual activity early and they will not stop with, you know, that um, in, in that behavior. But no direct evidence has been found in the sexuality standards here. And again, the individual curricula developed may also may have those. Promotes condom use in inappropriate ways. This is a very big emphasis in all of these, just, well, everyone that I've seen, comprehensive sexuality education uh, curricula. They are uh, determined to have children handle condoms, put condoms on uh, anatomical models. The teacher will sometimes demonstrate the condom. Um, 
they will, again, very, look, look at the detail here. Immediately before sex, engage in foreplay. I mean, okay, fine. You know, this is so inappropriate, you, you don't even know what to say. Um, it's, again, it normalizes that condom use is going to totally prevent pregnancy and STDs, and that does not happen. Condoms do not, are not effective in that way, and they're not used consistently and correctly because, again, we're talking about teenagers often in very strange situations, often in a hurry. They will think they know, they go into these situations, and they end up with a disaster on their hands. And so uh, then, of course, they've been sexualized during this whole process. You could just read my screen. And the other thing, well, I think that, again, because at missionamerica.com, if you'd like to know a lot more about the homosexual and transgender agenda directed to our kids in schools, we've been researching this for 20 years. We have a lot on our website. Um, often what you hear is people talking out of both sides of their mouths on the issue of homosexuality and, and uh, bisexuality as if, oh yeah, we're born that way. And then you get this kind of an information, piece of information, which is buried in all kinds of other homosexual material. It is important for everyone to know about contraception because even if they might not use it personally, they might have friends in sexual relationships with someone of a different sex. Okay, so they're saying that the homosexually inclined kids need to know about this because they need to tell someone else, but also that they might, <clears throat> excuse me, they might themselves be involved in uh, one of those relationships at some point. The, the variability in sexuality is well known. You can change from being a homosexual or bisexual, and people know that. This um, fluidity is dangerous in and of itself because of all the uh, various behaviors involved. <clears throat> okay, number eight, promotes premature sexual autonomy. And again, what we are seeing is the idea that you have a right. You have a right. This is everywhere now. You have sexual rights. Uh, Advocates for Youth is promoting that. Uh, GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network is promoting that. Uh, Planned Parenthood is promoting that. You have a right to have sexuality. And people that deny you all of this obscene material are, are, what are they doing? They're denying you your rights. Well, here we are. These standards by the end of eighth grade, students should be able to apply a decision-making model to various sexual health decisions. So, um, you know, it, it assumes that most, many children will be having, are already having sex and, or soon will be, and the majority of kids do not have sex, and those that are, many, of many times, are coerced into these sexual situations. So Planned Parenthood's All One Curriculum uh, has students participate in an exercise called Feeling Ready to Have Sex. And so you go through the decision-making process of, um, am I ready to have sex? What are the most important decisions? You know, kids think they're ready for lots of things, and that's why they have adults, because that's why they're not voting or driving or drinking underage, uh, because they're not ready for a lot of things, and maturity levels just aren't there. And so this pushes the idea that you're ready when you think you are. Well, you're in a, a relationship that seems uh, where there's a lot of uh, emphasis on this. You'll go ahead. Mateo has begun to hint that he's ready to have sex. Plan a role play. Again, imagine two kids in, your, in a classroom participating in such a role play in which Mateo talks with Hannah about having sex and they make a decision. That's often not how it happens and we know that, but okay, that's what they're doing here. Now here we are normalizing same-sex relationships. Andrea and Diana, or Andrea and Diana, are two girls who just met last weekend at a party. They had fun together, and now they've hooked up again, normalizing that behavior. This weekend, they're alone in Andrea's basement, playing a role play in which Diana asks Andrea about having sex, and they make a decision. A 
imagine the teacher selecting and the teacher's manual will push this that the kids need to not object to these same sex role plays because they need to accept uh, diversity and so on. Imagine pushing kids who are not inclined in homo homosexuality at all into such a role play. Do we not think that these are middle schoolers and high schoolers that this will be followed up after these role playing uh, scenarios with teasing, possibly cyberbullying, all kinds of embarrassment uh, later on? That's just one of the many problems with this, but that's another one because kids' innocence and modesty is being smashed here. Their own natural standards and the standards they may have been taught by their family are being smashed here. By the end of 12th grade, students should be able to apply a decision-making model to choices about contraception, including abstinence and condoms, as if they're equivalent. They're not equivalent. You know, no, they're not equally healthy choices. So, so, and again, this undermines parental input into a child's life. Curriculum example, there is no right age to have sex. Each person has to determine when he or she feels ready to have sex. We have an Ohio law, I will repeat it again, that emphasizes abstinence shall be the expected standard because that's, again, I'm paraphrasing the law, but that's where uh, over time we have found that the best benefits for all human beings lie is to wait until marriage for sex. And this, these curricula, absolutely defy Ohio law. Okay, number nine, fails to establish abstinence as the expected standard, and so I've just talked about that a little bit. By the end of eighth grade, students should be able to define sexual abstinence as it relates to pregnancy prevention. Um, you define sexual abstinence as it relates to pregnancy prevention. Uh, you no, know, there's many other sexual acts that they are emphasizing here. You know, many of these curricula, the CSE curricula, will say that abstinence can include oral and anal sex, okay, uh, or all kinds of other activities short of uh, actual pregnancy producing um, intercourse. That's not true. That's not abstinence. All of those are, should be, uh, abstinence should be a part of the definition of uh, not having sexual, intimate sexual contact until marriage. This also promotes the transgender ideology, affirming uh, the, the dif different gender identities for children. And um, while many of these standards are listed below may be true and some children do experience a feeling or belief they are a different gender or sex than their biological sex. Um, this is a debilitating disorder, absolutely. This should be resolved with counseling because there's usually an underlying problem and almost all of these gender confusion situations, if left undealt with, with uh, opposite sex hormones, puberty blockers earlier than that, or uh, and some teen teenagers are now getting uh, surgery for healthy body parts. You know, if left alone, most of the time, these kids will accept the gender of their birth by the time they reach adulthood. But this uses all, th these curricula, this, these standards, uh, use all of the buzzwords of acceptance of the idea that you can change gender. And, or, and that there's nothing wrong with it. You can never change gender, and there is a great deal of medical, emotional, and social consequence to even attempting to change gender. So this is highly irresponsible in almost every way you can imagine. Uses the, uh, the language of Biological sex, our sex is determined by our chromosomes, such as XX or XY, our hormones and our internal and external anatomy. Typically, we are assigned the sex of male or female at birth. That's the sexuality standards. No, we are not assigned a sex at birth. birth it, our sex is discovered at birth, and sometimes before, because of prenatal testing. No, we are, we are male or female. And that is, that is what we are. These are lies. This is deception. This is 
very well-crafted deception that leads kids down very problematic roads. Number 11, promotes abortion and contraception to children. Okay, so abortion is in the standards, a medical intervention that ends a pregnancy. Now actually it's a medical intervention that ends a life, but that is not used anywhere here. So here's an example. And then they start selling you on your rights. Minors in California have the right to obtain an abortion without notifying their parents or any other adult if they do not wish to do so. 13 and 14 year olds are told this in the three R's curriculum. Um, so in Ohio, if you don't have that right, quote unquote, all of a sudden, what happens? You're, you want to be able to say, I want to go do this because I have a right to do that. There are reasons why people, uh, that, that has been, uh, there's been a lot of limitation on abortion in Ohio, and we just are thankful for that. We're not California. By the end of eighth grade, students should be able to explain the health benefits, risks, and effectiveness rates of various methods of contraception, including abstinence and condoms. Again, abstinence is not a method of contraception. Abstinence is the absence of having sexuality that might need contraception. So not, another standard promotes peer-to-peer -peer sex ed and sexual rights advocacy. I've just covered some of that already. By the end of eighth grade, students should be able to advocate for safe environments that encourage dignified and respectful treatment of everyone. Sure, but we know what they mean by that. They mean, they mean all behaviors, not everyone. Every person, including many problematic behaviors like homosexuality, gender confusion, the sexually active student who has somehow gotten through all of this and no one has suggested to them that, guess what? Your life would be better, less risky, happier, and you have a better future if you recapture abstinence. This is, does not seem to be something that they're going to emphasize here. Number 13, undermines traditional values and beliefs. All of these CSE curricula do that. They want to put your parents and all of your background, your religious teaching and everything on notice that these people are ignorant. They really don't know. The latest, trust us for the latest and greatest. We will show you a better way, quote unquote, um, that in, in a way just, just, just so happens to be what you might want to do in a relationship when you're tempted to become sexual way too early. It's, it's really, um, a betrayal of these children. It's a true betrayal of, of the responsibility that adults ought to give to them. But they will um, show different respect for different kinds of families, that is, two men or two women. Uh, increasingly, and I'm not kidding, this is going to be uh, polyamorous families where there are groups of people who consider themselves married to one another. That's already been legalized in uh, Utah, for instance. So um, we are going to see many, many um, values and beliefs, homework assignment about values and beliefs challenged here. Uh, there's an assignment here on values and beliefs, including the question, if your values and beliefs are different from your parents or caregivers, values and beliefs about these topics, what do you think caused the difference in belief? Well, they're going to uh, convince you that it's because your parents really and caregivers don't really know as much as these teachers do. And this is, they don't have the latest information and uh, they're really backward. Do you, does everyone agree with the dominant cultural attitudes about sexuality? Again, usually about homosexuality and gender confusion. If anybody in your household disagrees with those, oh, wow, they're being put on notice here. So um, number 14, undermines parents or parental rights, and we've discussed some of that already. By the end of eighth grade, students should be able to identify medically accurate resources about pregnancy prevention and reproductive care, and they want them uh, to be very familiar with the kinds of uh, contraception available and access this and know that you can get all of this 
without notifying or getting permission from parents or guardians in many cases. And then they give the example again of wonderful California. Oh, why don't we live in California? And I actually, Planned Parenthood, unfortunately, um, has the same, the same uh, approach here. They want kids to know that um, they can um, access uh, different resources and uh, uh, clinics and services that will provide all of this to them without their parents' notice and, and belief, um, notification and permission. And their follow-up at the end is the resources that they use. Guess who's missing? Any pro-life or pro-family resources. These are all far left pro-teen sexuality resources. And some of them are unbelievably graphic. Uh, there are websites out there like Answer. Um, there are um, websites like um, uh, um, Bed Bedsider and some of the others that are adv uh, advocated by the groups, uh, Advocates for Youth, GLSEN, uh, Planned Parenthood. Some of the things that you will see are absolutely over the top as far as graphic and um, inappropriate for kids. This is heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking that kids are being led down this path. So I'm going to stop sharing at this point and uh, wrap this up for this, this video. So one of the things I think we need to remember is that it's up to parents to intervene. Most school districts are uh, they're, they are managed on a local basis and certainly in Ohio. So you need to get involved and say, wait a minute, what is being taught to my children? And if you have any questions, any questions, uh, please let us know. Let um, Diane Stover at Ohio Value Voters know. Let me know at Mission America. And if we can help you at all, we would be happy to do that. And find out for yourself and go to these school board meetings and say, I'm sorry, this is totally inappropriate and it's unhealthy, it's unhealthy. Waiting until marriage has been associated in every study that's ever been out there with higher academic performance, better long-term health, better happiness, and with ha doing things ethically, not taking a human life through abortion, for instance and being tempted to do that. So let's hold those standards up. Those are the high standards that our kids need, not these graphic uh, agenda-laden standards that are going to put our children at risk and corrupt them. Thank you very much.